safeguarding marine life and fisheries through the SDGs, charting a path towards a sustainable future. In the light of the agreement of fisheries, the theme of today's discussion becomes highly relevant and we are honored to have this distinguished panel with us to shed some light on it. I welcome our panelist for today's discussion, Professor Dr. Mukesh Bhatnagar, Independent Consultant on Fisheries, Subsidies and International Trade Issues. Sir has been a professor at the Center for WTO Studies, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, New Delhi, and was also the additional Director General of Foreign Trade at the Directorate General of Foreign Trade, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. I welcome you, sir. I'm, delight to, I'm delighted to welcome Ms. Raina Fan, Head of Science, Communication and Outreach, Wheel Seeker, Montreal, Canada. Ms. Fan is a graduate of McGill University, Canada, and has done intensive research on niche areas in fisheries and oceans in Canada. Welcome, ma'am. I'm also delighted to welcome on this virtual podium, Mr. Sunil Murlidhar Shastri, sir, FRGS, FRCA, Consultant, Ocean and Environment Governance. Sir is the director of International Ocean Institute, Ocean Academy India, and is also a fellow of the Royal Society for Encouragement of Arts, Manufacture and Commerce and Royal Geographical Society, UK. Sir also has a postgraduate degree in environmental economics and policy analysis from the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm delighted to welcome on this virtual dais, Ms. Gant, Managing Director, Manti Holdings Limited, Canada. Ma'am describes herself as a passionate mentor and visionary businesswoman and has uh, previously worked as a business and financial strategist for Wealth Academy International. I welcome you, ma'am. I, I would request everyone to join me in welcoming Dr. Rashmi Agarwal. Professor Shivnadar University, Noida. Before joining SNU, Dr. Agarwal was associated with IMT Ghaziabad as a professor and held various academic and administrative positions like the chairperson of the PGDM program, the chairperson of the Media and Corporate Relations, chairperson of International Relations Committee, and the coordinator of the coveted AACSB accreditation at the IMT. Dr. Agarwal's teaching areas are corporate law, corporate governance, internal audits, risk management, and international trade law. Lastly, I'm also extremely delighted to welcome Dr. Ritu Dhingra, IUCN CEESP Regional Vice Chair East and Southern Asia. Ma'am was a visiting professor at the North Cap University Gurgaon and has also worked as a research and environmental lawyer at Law Linkers and Company and has an experience of over 26 years of working in this, well, in this field. I welcome all the panelists today and I hope that it will be an engaging session. I now call upon the student moderator to invite the first speaker. Thank you, ma'am. I'm Dhruvi Agarwal. I will be moderating today's panel discussion. I now invite Professor Dr. Mukesh Bhatnagar to share a few words on the theme of the discussion and deliver the opening remarks. Very good evening to all, ladies and gentlemen. And I thank at the outset uh, Hidayatullah National Law University for giving me this opportunity to, to share some thoughts on the panel discussion on safeguarding marine life and, it, and fisheries through SDGs, charting a path towards a sustainable future. I also welcome and uh, can convey my greetings to my co-panelists <clears throat> and look forward to very engaging uh, discussions in, in this panel. Uh, when we talk about SDGs, uh, it is SDG 14. Uh, sub sustainable Development Goal 14, which is about life below water. And uh, 
within the goal 14 there are several targets which are which are there and which are so closely intertwined with the marine life oceans sustainability livelihood and all and and uh, anything to do with environment for sustaining the the life below the oceans and quite a lot of work has been done in this area and i'll be speaking a bit in greater detail on on target 14.6 but if you look at uh, article 14.7 uh, uh, then it, it also talks about by 2030 increase the economic benefits to small island developing states and least developed countries from the sustainable use of marine resources including through sustainable management of fisheries aquaculture and tourism 14.6 talks of that by 2020 prohibit certain forms of fishery subsidies which contribute to overcapacity and overfishing eliminate subsidies that contribute to illegal unreported and unregulated fishing refrain from introducing new such subsidies recognizing that appropriate and effective special and differential treatment for developing and least developed countries should be an integral part of wto fishery subsidies negotiations uh, the 14.6 is is a target and goal with which i have also been closely associated while working in the center for wto studies and prior to that in department of commerce government of india in the negotiations held in the in the wto on on fishery subsidies prohibition uh, the negotiations if uh, if we look at which spent uh, two decades it started with the doha round in 1991 uh, and now uh, we we are in uh, 2022 uh, the June 2020, uh, sorry, uh, my dates are get, getting a bit haywire, but in all, it took 20 years for the fishery subsidies agreement to, to really take shape. On 17th June 2022, members of WTO were able to conclude a significant part of the fishery subsidies agreement. It is still not a complete agreement. Uh, uh, because some parts of it are to be to be negotiated uh, further in the agreements concluded on 17th june 2022 there are uh, two elements or two pillars mainly prohibit subsidies uh, that go for or that support illegal unreported and unregulated fishing iuu and iuu as we know is a is a fao's 2001 plan of action to prevent deter and eliminate illegal unreported unregulated fishing so it is already there as per fao's 2001 plan and in the in the in the fishery subsidies agreement one part of it is now to prohibit subsidies which contribute to in illegal unreported and unregulated fishing so that goes in the way of sustainability in the sense that subsidies for activities in on fishing which which are either illegal or unreported or unregulated as per the fao's uh, provisions paragraph 3 of fao's uh, code of conduct such subsidies are to be prohibited but when these will be prohibited only when a determination is made either by a coastal state or a regional fisheries management organization or a or a flag state that iuu fishing has happened if such a determination is made then the subsidizing member is, is expected rather uh, under obligation to prohibit subsidies to such fishing vessels or operators. That is about IUU. The second element of fisheries subsidies agreement concluded on 17th June is that where the stocks are overfished, then no subsidies are to be provided. Uh, how the stocks are overfished? It is a it's a complex process for 
a coastal state to come to a, a determination that stocks are overfished or by a regional fisheries management organization that stocks are overfished. It's, a, it's an obligation cast upon the coastal states to keep on assessing the health of these uh, marine stocks within uh, their jurisdiction. And when they come to know that certain fishery stocks, a particular species or certain fish stocks are in a state of declining state of uh, sustainability, that means they are going below the maximum sustainable lead. That is the terminology which has been used in the agreement. Then it is expected of the coastal state or the WTO member to stop subsidizing, not to grant subsidies for such stocks which are in an uh, overfish condition. There, interestingly, uh, the agreement as has been you know worked out, agreed on 17th June, there is a sustainability clause added that if the subsidizing member has certain measures or certain subsidies in place which ensure a sustainable level or or a or or methods or measures whereby the health of the biological health of marine stocks are kept at a, uh, at a sustainable level then even if they there is an overfished overfished stocks happening they can continue to grant subsidies provided they ensure that the health of the fishery stocks will be maintained at sustainable level so it during the negotiations it was it was uh, often argued that uh, it is seems to be an escape clause or a loophole that in the sense that despite stocks being found as overfished a member will be permitted to grant subsidies uh, but then uh, the compromise was that if if a subsidizing member is able to demonstrate that measures are taken to ensure that the stocks are being maintained at a biologically sustainable level, it can continue to grant subsidies. Uh, these are the two elements or pillars which have been concluded and the agreement, uh, but the agreement has not yet come into force. Uh, the agreement, although having been, you know, agreed through that ministerial declaration on 17th June 2022, but it will be, it will come into force only when two third of the WTO membership ratifies it or submits a protocol of acceptance. And what has happened till date is that only three countries, Switzerland, Singapore and Seychelles have submitted their instruments of acceptance of this new agreement. And lot many countries which are, you know, key players in fishery subsidies negotiations, which are key players in 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 uh, marine capture production have yet to submit their uh, letters or their uh, acceptance of the new agreement word is awaiting wto is awaiting the director general of the uh, wto keeps on exhorting the wto members to uh, to submit their protocol of acceptance of the new agreement but but it's a watch uh, wait and watch game by many members they are watching each other and they are waiting for uh, acceptance of that. One big reason for acceptance of a large number of members having not come through is that one significant element of the new agreement, that is subsidies which contribute to overcapacity and overfishing has not been concluded. It was, a, a, it was some work which was left to be completed later on. So the, the decision in the ministerial uh, uh, pronouncement on 17th June 2022 was that a remaining part of the agreement will, will be negotiated further. And so the second wave of negotiations have started in the WTO Geneva, where the WTO members are now engaged in negotiating disciplines for subsidies to be prohibited where which are contributing to overcapacity and overfishing it has been a very complex uh, and uh, contentious uh, this, uh, pillar which had you know uh, escaped or which which could not be clinched on the 17th june because members still continue to have diverse positions uh, some members like india propagating that uh, uh, polluter pay principle should apply common but differentiated responsibility should apply. That means those who have polluted the uh, 
the oceans more those who were responsible for uh, for over exploitation of marine resources in the past through grant of large amount of subsidies must take greater responsibility in taking you know more obligations and those who were not responsible should have lesser responsibility special and differential treatment to developing countries was also a big issue to what extent special and differential treatment to developing countries has to be granted india has been a strong uh, votary of seeking effective and appropriate special and differential treatment in these negotiations because we have a large uh, population of uh, fishermen uh, some estimates say it, it's about close to 9 million which are dependent on on fisheries directly or indirectly on marine capture including uh, uh, sometimes aquaculture also and uh, their livelihood issues are are so important that uh, special and differential should be given to developing countries including india indonesia but the big problem is china china is the largest producer of marine capture and sometimes back for even for aquaculture and they have been also the biggest exporter of marine products if a horizontal special and differential treatment is to be given to all developing countries china will also be a beneficiary of that that was also not agreeable to the larger membership so a way was to be found out where special and differential treatment will be so carved out that those who need it really and who are not the big subsidizers are given the special and differential treatment so the the tussle was that <clears throat> whether special and differential treatment can be in the range of 5 years or up, up to 25 years which was the ask by india that you have a differentiated responsibility for uh, for having not to uh, not to be obligated by the provisions of the new agreement for 25 years because of the development needs of developing countries and there is a set of uh, small developing countries who have a share of less than 0.8% and global marine capture capture they were also being given a de minimis clause that lay, let them have a special and differential treatment so uh, special and differential treatment has been a very contentious issue and now when the negotiations have resumed in the wto to address the issue of over capacity and overfishing all these elements will be again gone through by the wto membership the discipline and also what kind of special and differential treatment to developing countries and ldcs will be will be granted uh the fao estimates that there are close to 58 million you know uh, uh, population which is employed in fisheries directly or indirectly as of year 2020 and it is also a known fact that the global stocks are overfished Uh, the fao's last report on status of marine resources which was of which is of 2022 you know which gave the data for the year 2020 states that up to 35 per- 35.4% of global marine fish stocks are in a state of overfished that means the 35% of global marine stocks are overfished so sustainability of marine stocks is a, is a big issue and that that number or extent of overfish is has been growing although now gradually it was in 70s it was only 10% now this has grown to 35.4% so the the biggest concern uh, and the challenge before the uh, global community is that growing extent of overfish stocks and which is leading to the depletion of marine resources and consequent issues of sustainability of stocks livelihood of fishermen environment and so on so uh, it is a it has imperative that uh, at least 14.6 target which is the you know disciplining of fishery subsidies is concluded at the fastest uh, two parts of it have been done but although these have not yet come into actual you know implementation stage but so, may come soon and the third part on overfishing and over capacity has to be negotiated with that the wto membership would have delivered on one part of the of the sdg that is 14.6 the remaining aspirations on 14.7 14.4 etc have also to be met and this is a big challenge for for the for the uh, global community that 
sustainability of fish stocks, ensuring the livelihood of small fishermen, ensuring that small and artisanal fishermen are not deprived of their, their livelihood because of the dwindling marine stocks or over exploitation of marine resources by large industrialized fishing vessels are to be you know curbed so these are these are the challenges which is facing the the global community and uh, we will have to uh, grapple with these as uh, as we move uh, further one important element of the ongoing fishery subsidies negotiations which is now continuing is that within the overcapacity and overfishing discipline uh, there is a sustainability clause in the sense that the way the tax was being negotiated uh, there are a list of subsidies like subsidies for vessel construction modernization fuel subsidies income support etc these are lists which are supposed to be prohibited but within that there was a sustainability clause that if uh, the subsidizing member is able to demonstrate that measures are implemented to ensure the stocks are in a, in a biologically sustainable level, that is biologically sustainable level, that means they, you are at a stage which is up to maximally sustainable yield, MSY, you can continue to grant subsidies. Again, this approach is a mix of hybrid of list plus uh, sustainability which was uh, you know agitated a lot which was argued that uh, the sustainability clause can become a big loophole those countries which are having a, a huge uh, or improved fisheries conservation and management measures will continue to grant subsidies by showing that they are having enough sustainability measures but then uh, as wto moves on you know consensus compromises have to be reached so in the months to come when the negotiations will move forward, it will have to be seen that whether fisheries sustainable measures of some of the developed, some of the members, largely the developed countries, will be able to implement sustainability of or ensure sustainability of global marine stocks. It will, it is something to be seen. And the WTO's mechanism will be through the WTO committees, which will oversee the implementation of the new agreement. That means members will, will demonstrate, will put some information out the sustainability measures they have, fisheries management measures they have, and then they will show that their stocks are adequately managed and they, they have measures in place to ensure that fish stocks do not go to a dangerous or unsustainable level. So this is a, 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 again a part unfinished work which will have to be completed by the WTO membership. On the ex, uh, international trade in, in fish, I think as we all know, uh, fish is a very highly traded commodity. A lot of marine capture is not for self-consumption, it, it is for exports. And the extent of uh, exports of uh, aquatic products in 2020 was 151 billion US dollar. So this, this is huge. And a lot of fishing takes place for trade, for, uh, for uh, exports. And which is also, uh, you know, an impetus for catching more and more. So, uh, port state major agreement to curb illegal, unreported, unregulated fishings. All these steps will have to be ensured, you know, to curb illegal fishing and to ensure sustainability of uh, marine stocks. I'll stop here and help, and and will be happy to uh, take any questions if if there will be a Q and A section. Thank you very much. I now invite Mr. Sur Sunil Murlidhar Shastri, FRGS, FRSA, to answer a few questions on the theme of the discussion. So, can you hear me? Yes, sir. So, the first Thank question to you. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, Dhruvi for conducting this session. And I'm delighted to hear this erudite take that we have just had from uh, Professor Bhatnagar. Thank you. So, the first question to you is, how do you think we can ensure that ocean governance policies are equitable and benefit all stakeholders, including marginalized communities? Okay, thanks. Thanks for that question. Now, in my mind, uh, ocean governance. I mean, I want to say a few words about ocean governance, and it has its foundations 
uh, in the twin pillars, I, I would like to call them, of United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, the Rio Summit, so 82 and 92. Now, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development also has two big offshoots, uh, more than that actually, but I just want to get two relevant ones here, which is the Convention on Biological Diversity and of course the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, these two, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and the United Nations uh, Conference on Environment and Development of 82 and 92, were hailed by none other than Javier Perez de Queller, the Secretary General of the United Nations at that time, as two mighty rivers that will not only change the course of ocean governance or environmental governance, but also global governance. And that is exactly what we are seeing today through the formation of many other multilateral agreements, including the most recently concluded High Seas Treaty. So High Seas Treaty or the BBNJ Treaty is a welcome third pillar in my mind. I also think that ocean governance is an encapsulation of a whole range of multilateral conventions, treaties, agreements, etc. Call them what you, what, you, what you like. But they are in turn represented through this concrete, albeit aspirational, sustainable development goals. You know, this whole idea of ocean governance or environmental governance has been neatly encapsulated in these 17 sustainable goals. We have seen them and we know about them. We're talking about them. But there's a different way of representing it, which is very interesting, I found, from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, by Rockstrom and Sukhdev, and they call it the SDG wedding cake, the Sustainable Development Goals wedding cake. And they, they of course, introduced the concept of planetary boundaries, etc. But that's another subject. And that's been taken up by uh, Catherine Rawson in her book, Donut Economies. But that's a completely different story. But let's go look at the wedding cake. And the, the base of the wedding cake is on, on the environment or the planet, as you would like to call it. So there we have uh, the goals 6, 13, 14, and 15. 14 is the one that we are talking about. So that's the base of the cake. The next year is the society, which is goals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 11, and 16. And that's focused on people. That's anthropocentric. That's people-centered or society-focused. And the icing on the cake is the economy. You know, obviously, we want to uh, develop. We want to get, get economy. We want to have sustainable development, most importantly. And Goals number 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, 10, and 12, they look at the profit or the economy. And on the top, on the very top of that wedding cake is the cherry on the cake, which I call uh, the, the, the goal 17, which is partnership for goals, for achieving the goals. Now, the other thing that is going on simultaneously in ocean governance is 30 by 30. It's an interesting target, aspirational target, maybe, I don't know at, at this time, but it's an interesting target going hand in hand with the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. It's what, what, what it's, it's, it says that the motto of that is the science we need for the ocean we want. Now, Marine Protected Areas, the BBNJ Treaty, will contribute, in my mind, to poverty alleviation, along with other things, by increasing fish catch income, creating new jobs, improving health, and empowering women. And this last one, empowering women, is one of the most important thing needed for the coastal rural community. And it's needed for any rural community or any uh, uneducated or un, 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 uh, and poor people, but more importantly to the coastal rural community because they have very little opportunity other than doing what they do, which is helping their fisher folk. So with climate change and social equity addressed, restoring the ocean will help alleviate poverty, provide livelihoods, and improve the health of millions of people around the world. And that is what is the contribution of ocean governance in this. Ocean governance facilities also facilitate, sorry, ocean governance policies also facilitate the establishment of equitable, gender just, you know, empowering women I just talked about, self-reliant and sustainable fisheries, particularly in the small scale and the artisanal sector. If you see my own logo, if you see ocean governance, if you see my own logo, Ocean and Environmental Governance, at the bottom of it, I have got six circles. I'm just plugging for myself here. And the six circles are reflecting those three, three parts of the cake, the environment, society, and, uh, uh, and, the, pla and, the, uh, and, and economy, which I call people, planet, and profit. And the other three circles, 
are equity, justice, and peace. So it is the equity. It is the very important thing is equity and the justice to these, these coastal communities that will lead to peace. And peace, as Mahatma Gandhi very famously said, is not mere absence of war. It has got societal, it's got economic, and increasingly environmental uh, considerations. And that is how I think that the current ocean governance policies will be able to help coastal communities, particularly the marginalized coastal communities, to, to get over, get above their sort of levels, as it were, of poverty or, or uneducated masses and uh, upliftment of women in particular. I think that is what I want to say. And, you know, I'll take any comments that you might have regarding this. Thank you. talked about coastal communities what are some of the concerns that the coastal communities have regarding exploitation of marine resources now this is this is i mean this is a, a vast topic because what are the concerns of coastal communities they're huge i mean absolutely first of all i want to introduce this concept of what i call as a hookah world this hookah is actually a management term which i learned when i first went to england in the 80s and it is talking about the the systems, the management systems, which are vulnerable, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. If you look at the planet, if you look at the ocean, if you look at our, our earth, if you look at the environment, that is a perfect VUCA system because it's vulnerable. We know the ocean is vulnerable, the planet is vulnerable, the climate is vulnerable. We know it's uncertain. Things that are happening around us are very uncertain. So it's, it's very important for us to learn about them. They are complex. And they're also ambiguous. There is no clarity there. So this is the VUCA system that we operate in. And the coastal ecosystems are part of that VUCA system, which is making the life of coastal communities even more vulnerable, more uncertain, more complex, and more amb ambiguous. So there are multiple whammies affecting. So the concerns for the coastal communities are multiple. There are multiple whammies affecting uh, coastal community, extreme natural events. You know, we see more of them happening these days, floods, hurricanes, coastal storms, tsunamis, landslide, you name them. And in addition to them, the large long term. So these are these are happening on an annual or a seasonal basis. But the longer term impacts of something like sea level rise or coastal erosion, this is happening the whole time. And that is that is a long term impact of these things uh, affecting the coastal communities. Coastal pollution is another big, big concern for the coastal communities. All pollution, you know irrespective of where it happens, you know, you have this whole concept of hilltop to the ocean. Everything starting from the hilltop ends up in the ocean, along with the water and the pollution and everything else. All pollution ends up in the ocean, in the coast. And industrial, agriculture, urban, again, you name it, all of it ends up in the ocean. In fact, there was a study by Gazam not too long ago, and it said that 80% or even up to 90% of all pollution that is found in the ocean is from land-based sources. And in, on top of that pollution, there's a constant threat of alien species that will come into your coast, that will wipe out, wipe out your, your uh, indigenous uh, you know, species and so on. So this threat of in, uh, alien species is also in addition to the pollution. Coastal habitat destruction in the name of development, you know, you want to have you know, tourism, etc or particularly what, what we call as coastal gentrification or ocean gentrification of climate and gentrification, whatever you call like to call it. Mass tourism has got to be more responsible in order to protect coastal habitat destruction in the name of development. All these factors negatively impinge on the fishery, which is a mainstay of coastal communities. Perhaps the positive side of exploitation of non-living resources and tourism and shipping might provide some hope for the livelihood but the coastal communities may not always benefit from them because of the lack of education. You know, that's that's the key thing that is lacking in coastal communities. If you see India, uh, even if, if you see the uh, ed education levels in the coastal regions, they are lower, except for the state of uh, Kerala, they are lower than the rest of the hinterland uh, part of the country. Fishing is an inherently dangerous profession. So that's another concern. You know, it's, it's an absolutely dangerous, I mean, I have spent, you know, we have we have uh, coastal fishermen offering us a day on the on their fishing boat and all that. And it is scary. It is absolutely scary for the eight hours that you spend with them because it's, it's just it just 
so dangerous and so hazardous with little little way of assured employment they don't know whether they have the employment tomorrow or not depending on whether the captain picks them up or not the next day ensure they don't have insurance against accidents against deaths or anything like that artisanal fisher folk are often unorganized they are they are a big unorganized sector and unscrupulous gang members are known to exploit their poverty lack of education and desperation to even uh, to earn a living coastal communities are often likely to come under influence of international criminal networks and this we have seen all over the world particularly in the developing countries of asia africa and latin america uh, low because this is low risk high gain nefarious activities such as you know transportation of drugs narcotics and even human trafficking and worse still piracy and they might get into the vicious circle also of maritime slavery you'll be surprised to know that 55 million people 55 million people in the world today are suffering under maritime slavery this is contemporary slavery i'm talking about today you know so the fishery sector receives the lowest price this is this is this is the thing that i always say as a as an ocean governance person not just the fishery sector but the ocean as a whole punches way below its weight and this has got to change you know we got only one sustainable development goal among 17 for the ocean which is 99 percent of the biosphere of the earth so the fishery sector receives the lowest priority in comparison to forestry agriculture industry so the legitimate livelihood interest livelihood and interest of the fishing community of the fishers and the fishing communities are often over overlooked in the inter-sector inter-sector conflicts over land and water resources which are decided by the policy makers sitting in the state capitals or on central capitals all over the world and this, this is all the concern but one of the one of the, one of the biggest concern according to me is the fish is the cheapest source of animal protein three and a half billion to four billion people have nothing else but fish as their source of animal protein but it is hardly available to the poor coastal communities who actually catch them and i'll give you a simple example i live in europe i'm fortunately or unfortunately i'm not a member of the european union now my country is not but the eu common fisheries policy you know has devised things in such a way that they call it lovingly third country agreements but eu production of fish is 4 million tons annual production but the consumption guess is 16 million tons so where does the other 12 million tons come from it comes from you and me our, our, our developing countries it comes from the coastal communities of developing countries you know these high value products uh, such as uh, crabs and such as prawns etc you don't get to eat them they they end up in the plates of europeans so these are some of the major concerns uh, of of, of uh, fishing communities uh, particularly in the developing countries of the world including uh, in india uh, i hope this is a relevant answer to your or, or it, it sort of answers your question thank you thank you for those brilliant answers i now invite dr ritu dhingra to answer a few questions on the theme of the discussion ma'am Ma'am, you are not audible. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ankit and the team for inviting me on this panel of discussion. And I am really enlightened to hear the views of Professor Dr. Mukesh Mitnagar and Mr. Sunil Murlidhar. And I totally agree with that what they say. So uh, I would like to present something via presentation so as to highlight the works which are being done by IUCN. And I had to restrict myself only to uh, SDG 14. And there are so many things which are going on because only SDG 14 cannot be taken care of. We, we have to work on land, we have to work on the mangroves, we have to work on air, water, everything is connected. So I would like to share uh, my presentation and your questions will be answered through it. So can I do this? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We have made uh, you the presenter. 
Okay, so so can I present tongue? Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen or otherwise I'll speak uh, if you cannot see it? Can you please send the presentation to us? We uh, screen share. Oh yeah, I can do that. I can do that. One second. One second, I'll, I'll just send you the presentation. Um, could you share, uh, send the presentation on Ankit Sir's mail ID, please? Yeah, I, I'm sending. Otherwise, I, if it is not feasible, I can answer your questions uh, uh, that way as well. We shall be asking you the question. Yeah. How can we increase public awareness about importance of marine life and the need for its protection and sustainable use? Yes, uh, I would like to answer this from the IUCN point of view. And for over 70 years, uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature as a membership union has worked towards a sustainable future for people. 170 countries are members and the vision is just word that values and conserve natures. Uh, the membership comprise of state, government agencies, and national and international government and indigenous people organization. And they approve a program every four years. So IUCN works to cons conserve coastal, marine, polar ecosystems, and the many benefits they provide for humanity. So moreover, they, we have many expert groups for the protection of oceans, like we have fisheries expert group within the Commission for the Ecosystem Management. We have the People and the Ocean Specialist Group, which is a part of SEAS, which I'm a member of, and I'm also the Regional Vice Chair. And there is a Marine Team for the con uh, World Commission on the Protected Areas, which is WCPA IUCN. And then the World Commission on Environmental Law uh, Specialist Group, there is an Ocean Group, which looks into the various agreements which are taking place and of course the latest one and they have been working on it for the past 20 years so the marine by there is a marine biological diversity unit and this unit uh, as you know it pertains to the red list the marine biodiversity unit of iucn uh, it is a species program and it was formed to expand the representation of marine species on the red list and is headquartered in USA. It is a global interdisciplinary team and network of volunteer, scientific experts, specialists in taxonomy and systematics, marine biology, spatial analysis, resource management, science communication and marine conservation planning. So they look into which species is dying and which species is getting in extinct. There is a system which where we find out uh, how the species are into various categories, like the least concern, the threatened, the extinct, about to extinct. So the principal mandate for MBU is the completion of the global marine species assessment. The first global review of the threat of extinction for approximately 20,000 marine species assessed during the IUCN red list categories and it is an ongoing initiative. Assessments are made publicly and freely and are available to the IUCN red list list. So other initiatives are 178 million tons of aquatic animals are fished or produced through the aquaculture. This is an I IUCN's initiative for creating an awareness. Instead of fishing, they are promoting this aquaculture and it is in collaboration with FAO also. 600 million people rely on the fisheries and aquaculture sector for their livelihood. So also they are involved in building an ambition for a high, new high seas fisheries. 
through the IUCN webinars, we are conducting such, uh, we are, have think tanks and high seas alliance has been made. Advancing in gender and environment. Gender in fisheries, a sea opportunities. This is a very important topic where women are involved in fishing. So IUCN has special teams which work for the gender. High seas bottom trawl fishes and their impact on the biodiversity of vulnerable deep sea ecosystems. And they have options for international action. IUCN is trying to influence to con control this deep sea bed mining, which is a very hazardous for the biodiversity. IUCN is also working on the climate change and oceans and understanding the signs of climate change threats to the ocean, ocean, ocean warming, acidification, deoxygenation, marine heat waves, as well as the culminative effect of these individual ocean stressors and the risk this poses to nations and economics around the world. As a part of IUCN science to governance approach, this scientific understanding forms the bedrock of IUCN ocean policy work, be it through recommendations to delegates, to international negotiations, or through government and stakeholders at regional level. So how there is a consolidated approach towards climate change and that they reconnect, we reconnect land, water, oceans, and climate. So we retain water, we restore climate, we resource ocean, and we reconnect land in order to conserve uh, in order to like uh, mitigate the climate changes and my view about creating awareness is that the schools and the university curriculum must impart uh, knowledge related to oceans high seas pollution plastic pollutions in the oceans all these things must be highlighted because maximum pollution to the oceans is going through the land Usually students from landlocked states like we in Delhi do not have much exposure to sea and ocean related issues. So they should be given education and special trips be, should be organized by the schools and the university to the coastal states for the first hand information about the same. Uh, that's all for your first question. Thank you, ma'am. A follow up question to you is, how can technology and innovation be leveraged to promote sustainable use of marine life? Yes, uh, so like technology, you know, like what we have done is that there is so much going on uh, in the world today that recently IUCN has collaborated with uh, this way, this uh, tech for nature and supporting better conservation and outcomes in the protected and conserved areas. IUCN Global Protected and Conserved Areas Program is now leading a new open partnership called Tech for Nature together with the world's leading information and communication technology provider, Huawei. The aim of this partnership is to harness new innovative technologies in support of better conservation outcomes in and around protected and conserved areas. This technology can help better understand and conserve nature. This is the idea of uh, texture. I, this information technology could be applied to monitor and analyze habitats and biodiversity to improve operational efficiency, better connect the stakeholders of nature conservation. So, so and similarly, the uh, IUCN is working in aquaculture. So IUCN advocates that within the international uh, agreements to influence policy towards sustainable management of fisheries or aquaculture worldwide and has helped many nations in promoting aquaculture and raising economies. And also the there is a like, they, we have uh, IUCN has been promoting sustainable use of marine life through technology. Uh, the issue of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing is becoming a global concern. So IUCN is also taking care of this through its experts who are uh, ex scientifically qualified to handle all these problems. And also IUCN is working for the climate change and the science of climate change threats to the ocean and ocean warming and all these things have been taken care of by the IUCN's uh, expert teams. So that's all for this. So the technology is being taken care of for uh, uh, handling the problems of overfishing, habitat loss, climate change and all these things. They are trying to connect it. Recently, IUCN has been working on the coral reefs and they have a... Uh, like partnership with the MSC Foundation, 
where they will recently it is very recent that the msc foundation will will enable the completion of the comprehensive global assessment of the world scholar squirrel species on the iucn red list of threatened species so how do they find these threatened species technology plays a very important role in it that's all thank you for sharing your views with us ma'am Unfortunately, our next panelist, Ms. Catherine Hoss, could not join us due to a medical emergency. So we will be now inviting Ms. Lou De Gon to answer a few questions, ma'am. Thank you for having me, ma'am. The first question to you is: How can aquaculture help the fishery to become more sustainable? Thank you for having me on the panel again, and I really appreciate the knowledge and wisdom that all of the panelists are bringing here today and acknowledge all of the people who are listening in such a very timely topic. Um, we mentioned a while ago about the SDG number 14, which is mostly the focus for aquaculture and fisheries in terms of collaborating with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But sometimes we forget that number 17 is also very important. So I think to answer that question, partnerships for the goals is one of the things that we are promoting right now. Um, there's a lot of talk between the two camps, fisheries versus aquaculture, but it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, we are at the crooks in where we're in, we need to feed the population of the planet that's going to be billions and billions of people by 2030, 9 billion to 10 billion. And so we have to do every means so that we can go work together on how to feed the, the population. One of the things that we're seeing as the biggest challenge in terms of um, what's happening in the fisheries, so why it's collapsing is because there's a challenge in terms of estimating the natural recruitment. What we're finding here in Canada is that um, most of the fishermen are mostly getting the nicest best quality products and then so what's being left in the resource are the disease the runs not so good quality and so we need to find a solution how aquaculture can help in that by reseeding the common resource the second is the individual quota system um, the fishing licenses are allowed for example in our case um, the gooey duck shellfish originally when I started 15 years ago has 66,000 total allowable catch. It is now at 50,000 and originally in 1988 all of the licenses has a total allowable catch of 12.8 million pounds. It is now at 3 million pounds. So this is contrary against basic eugenics. What we need to do is to do away with the fishery selective harvesting strategy. Ma'am, a follow-up question to you is, how can aquaculture enhance the marine ecology? So, as mentioned, um, we need to move away from intensive aquaculture as well. So, um, you've seen this that's happened in the agriculture side of things. And so, it's now being cascaded both in the fisheries and the aquaculture, wherein you're planting too many animals in such a smaller area. And so, that doesn't prevent from getting diseases and also we can focus more on the efforts on extensive aquaculture which will enhance the natural ecology rather than intensive aquaculture which is really detrimental for the animals we need to find a way how the animals can be more natural with their surrounding ecology and this has been what we've been finding is that the humans have not done away with just taking advantage of nature and so we're paying the price for it i'd also like to share some of the sustainable fisheries trends that are happening um, climate change adaptation collaborative management innovative fishing gear traceability and transparency and ecosystem based fisheries management so we have to find a way so that we can see these future trends so that we can prevent a lot of fisheries that are collapsing right now and aquaculture is here to support that the future trends for uh, aquaculture are alternative protein sources recirculating aquaculture system genetic improvement imta um, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture and automation and technology and on a bigger umbrella sustainable food trends includes robotics digitization fintech rna technology which stands for 
ribonucleic acid and fermentation and a lot more. So we need to be able to open our eyes on seeing these future trends to prevent more damage that's happening both in fisheries and aquaculture. One thing that you will advise for people who are interested in this industry or are already part of this industry. I started with focus also on partnerships for the goals rather than just the life below water. So I think if we started with working together, it's better. Partner with those people who already are seeing the trends. The trends that I share with you are all available online and with the AI technology, chat GPT, artificial intelligence that everybody is buzzing around right now is very easy now to find information. And so I highly recommend, of course, I'm doing a shameless self-promotion to listen to the Business of Aquaculture podcast. So I have a lot of experts and masters there that have shared their time and their knowledge and wisdom generously. And I thank you all for having me today. Thank you for sharing your views. I now invite our next panelist, Dr. Rashmi Agarwal, to answer a few questions. Ma'am. Thank you, Dhruvi. How can SDGs help to protect marine life and promote sustainable use of oceans and seas? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Uh, you know, when we look at the sustainability development goals, uh, sometimes I used to wonder in 2015, why they are 17, why not 20, why not 50, why not 10? And, you know, kind of uh, having taken a deep dive into all of them, I realized that this is more to do with the resources that have been made available to us. And before we understand why they are 17, I must also share my principal thought on these. I feel nature is supreme. Nothing is more supreme than, than the nature. So going by that premise, whatever that we do, if we are wanting to be a champion over the nature, that is not going to happen. So better we keep our house in order and we look at each of these goals as to be an action point. And we don't have to get away by saying that, no, this is not applicable on us in one way or the other. Because sometimes, you know, it may not be our problem. Overfishing and overcapacitying may not be a problem of India right now, but uh, it could be a problem of us for us tomorrow going forward, right? Uh, so we have to understand we cannot be in, in an obligation uh, state. Uh, everything that has been given to us as a goal, uh, we should take it very seriously. Now, going forward to uh, predominantly the uh, development goal 14, uh, which is on fishing, uh, it is basically talking about a natural resource, which is ocean. But if you see the way it has been laid out in 14.1 to 14.9, everything is actually talking about the stakeholders and how there is a, a you know dotted line connection with every stakeholder going back uh, to the uh, you know uh, pollution of the oceans, going back to what can happen if you continue with the high uh, uh, you know sea fishing, uh, going back to what if you don't uh, give enough training to these small scale farmers, uh, what if there's a, there are not enough partnerships? Uh, I think each of them is bringing out a very critical element of survival of us as as a you know as a community as a, as a humankind. And, um, you know, from the economic perspective also, I feel that um, there's a lot of data that is there with us. We know that currently in 2023, we are always already in the mid of 2030, which so we have to achieve these goals by 2030. Uh, so we have to take each of this uh, parameter to be as serious as we can. Uh, USD 1.5 trillion economy based on oceans uh, is poised to be at 3 trillion by 2030. So we have to gear up, we have to leverage uh, these statistics to, to our as, and take this as an opportunity. Uh, that is, I think, the major uh, motive by which we should try and interpret these objectives. Um, a follow up question to you is how can we ensure that rights of small scale fishers and coastal communities are considered in achieving SDG 14 and promoting sustainable use of marine resources? Uh, well, how do we, you know, define the artisan or the small uh, scale fisheries, uh, you know, farm is, is another uh, definition. If we can fine tune that, I think that will really help us going forward. Uh, what is happening is that we have these large vessels, large fleets, which are going into the high sea fishing. 
and you know what they're doing is is they're definitely getting into overfishing which is uh, totally detrimental to the small time fishers in the country like india and we are a subcontinent by definition so you know 3/4 of our coastal line is there we have to use that and um, you know if you go to see the sustainability aspects of small uh, fish uh, fishing um, fishermen in india if you see the subsidy part of it as per the claims being made by the government of india we are not giving more than 1 dollar subsidy to each fisherman in india which is which is minuscule which is i think not by any global standards i think that is should not be an area of concern for us because government ought to do that right so we are not removing the subsidies no matter what uh, the international pressures may be we have to sustain them we have to make sure that 1 dollar remains compared to developed countries who are giving per fisherman a subsidy of $65000 also in few countries so as of now when we are looking at developing countries we are looking at developed countries and we are looking at least developed countries i think there's another category that is bound to be there which is the advancing developing countries like china or maybe south korea so on and so forth so we look we have to look into that dimension of the small uh, scale fishermen as well Uh, but for me i think we remain to be a developing country and uh, these sdt goals along with the subsidies uh, is important for their survival another thing is that you know uh, india happens to be a very indigenously uh, conscious um, kind of we are, whatever that we are doing is very indigenously uh, given to us right so for example historically and culturally also 61 days in one year india does not do any fishing and what are these 61 days that will depend from region to region uh, the day that uh, mr piyush goyal who was who was our minister of uh, commerce he gave this uh, lecture in the wto uh, saying that why are they not withdrawing the subsidies he said um, and i would like to quote him he said that today when i speak to the wto i can assure you there's no fishing happening in india so you know we are a very self conscious um, kind of you know we do understand the ecological balance and the diversity that we have to sustain uh, so going by this i think the things are much in place uh, that you know we make sure that there is not an over harvesting there is not an over fishing happening and i want to build on uh, professor shastri's point where he said that there are a lot of social inequities that have been uh, you know there uh, we are we don't want to be exporters of fish right Uh, we must make sure that the capacity that we have is being utilized within india because we also need proteins right why are we giving our virtual resources back to these uh, countries uh, you know let them not take away this important resource from us it's not only the price of a fish there is a lot of things that have gone along with the fish if you talk about agriculture there's a lot of talk about virtual water if you are exporting rice it's just not rice it's also the irrigation the water that has been used similarly for fishing also why are we giving away our produce so i think for that a lot of uh, collaboration needs to be uh, there in place and again i want to go to sdt 17 for this which talks about promoting partnerships so when we are talking about a uh, local fisherman uh, you know the delicacies the detectable uh, you know eateries that we have why should the prawn be served at that kind of a high price when it is being harvested in that local area itself so i think a very important uh, ecosystem needs to be built in a lot of industry needs to open right why only tourism when we are looking at coastal areas they are known for tourism but why uh, there there can be uh, delectables that can be carved out by our hospitality industry Uh, if you go to odisha if you go to puri we can have prawns which are specialized in that area we can have intellectual property come into picture we can actually create some kind of a branding of the harvesting you know i think there's a lot uh, there's a lot of collaboration as a potential that can be explored uh, when we seeing that let's go for a strategic collaboration with the hospitality industry with the tourism with the local uh, fishermen for them to leverage on what they are doing right now i think what is happening is just one part of the trade that we are looking at i think the issues are much larger they are much broader uh, marketing needs to come into picture uh, we need to have uh, some scientific um, uh, you know uh, kind of uh, theories that needs to be built on where harvesting is there and how do we uh, you know leverage on this capacity i hope that answers your question dhruvi i hope i am not uh, overwhelmed uh with my you know things on the planning part of it right i think we have a long way to go i now call upon our final panelists for today ms reena fan 
Ma'am, could you please answer some questions that we have? Hi, yes, of course. Thanks so much for having me. It's been such a great discussion so far. I'm learning a lot already. Excited to be here. First question to you is, how can there be greater awareness regarding the efforts being taken to protect marine life? So I think when we talk about um, raising greater awareness, we can talk about raising awareness within the fisheries and conservation sector between stakeholders, as well as awareness of the general public. For the first one, I think I'm so glad that the previous panelists have talked a lot about um, communication and collaboration and partnerships. Um, I think that's really key um, to foster uh, collaboration between industry, between academia um, and policymakers. Um, I think we need more funding for like um, initiatives that are local, especially for like small and medium businesses that bring together these different stakeholders to um, protect marine life and find conservation solutions. So I'm glad to hear that like this is a top priority for the IUCN as well. And really to make sure that we engage and involve fishers and coastal communities, the end users um, that are on the ground in conservation efforts and research. Um, the company that I work with, Whale Seeker, so we're a technology company and the products that we developed um, are software, <laughs> our software products, right? Um, and I'll talk more about what we do. Um, but uh, we develop products for the purposes of protecting marine life. And that's why even though like our, um, our output is technology, it's really important for us that we have the majority of the people that we have on staff like have a biologist background because our end users um, are biologists, for example, and that's really critical. And we work really closely with industry and the, 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 the people who actually use our technology um, uh, that we, we, we need uh, collaboration with to, to help in conservation. And I just think that we need to make sure that um, we're not working in silos where we're all kind of reinventing the wheel and to, um, as much as possible, foster a collaborative rather than a competitive mindset, um, as well, just like participating in conferences such as uh, such as this panel. I'm really happy that right now we can take advantage of, you know, how connected we are and the global reach that we have. We've had people talk from at least three different continents today, and that's really great. That's um, I'm so glad that we can get these different perspectives and share different knowledge and ideas. Um, in terms of generating awareness for the general public, I think that's super important, right? Um, we want people that maybe aren't involved in um, uh, the ocean industries or aren't involved in marine research to also care about the oceans because obviously it affects it affects all of us. And there's uh, you know the the benefits of SDG um, 14. Um, it's the least funded still, but it's the least financed, but we all know that you know it has spillover effects to all the other sustainable development goals. And so I think it's really important to get the public who you know are uh, electing our politicians and putting pressure on them to um, take environmentally friendly stances and um, make new policies. Um, it's important to get them. So I think uh, to do that, it's really important to highlight the stories of the people behind research conservation efforts. I think that really allows the audience to empathize and understand the motivations for conserving the oceans, because maybe if you live, um, as a previous uh, panelist said, like in a landlocked state, like maybe you don't realize like how um, important and how interconnected uh, we are with our oceans. And so there's um, the importance of like using like traditional media, social media, storytelling to meet people, um, where they are. Um, and I think it's a good idea to have a media person on staff, whether you're like a conservation organization, a private sector. Um, I think for like nonprofit organizations and in an in industry, that's something pretty common, but it's still uncommon for there to be like an outreach or media person in research and academia. Um, and I think uh, we often put the burden on um, professors or um, academics to be their own public relations person and to communicate their science. Um, I think we have a responsibility to do that, um, to share um, in a digestible way, like the kind of research that we're doing and to show like how important it is. But at the same time, that's a very different skill set than, you know, conducting research. And so some people um, are great at that and they love like also doing like the outreach and communications part of that of that job and that's great but a lot of people like you know they they went into science to be researchers so i think 
having some kind of media training as part of like your scientific training and or having someone who um, whose role is to um, talk to the media, communicate that science. Um, that's really important for generating interest, and awareness and having people care about about our oceans. Ma'am, a follow-up question to you. What are some new research tools that have been developed by the study? Yeah, so um, I'm glad that uh, artificial intelligence has uh, has been mentioned already. And so that's, of course, a really big category of emerging tools um, using AI to help study marine life and uh, manage our oceans. So, of course, like one of the major problems um, that we have for ocean management um, and uh, studying biodiversity in the ocean is scalability, right? Like the oceans are so big and we need um, to get like big overviews of large regions that are often remote, they're hard to get to, um, and we need like enough meaningful data to make proper decisions. And now like con collecting data is not like the big problem anymore, right? We have satellite, we have drones, we have hydrophones that are always like listening in the ocean. We have temperature sensors and those um, these types of sensors will gather a lot of data very quickly, but right now processing these data um, is, is a major bottleneck. Um, and so, right, there's no, there, there's no point in collecting all this data if, if it's too overwhelming for us um, to, to use it. And so AI is a very, very powerful tool, of course, like in this domain. And so I'll talk about what we do. Um, at Whale Seeker, we're using AI to solve the problem of processing um, remote sensing image data. We focus on detecting um, marine mammals from things like uh, aer aerial surveys, um, drones, um, and satellite imagery. And so normally when you when you want to do like a, like a population survey of marine megafauna, um, we focus on marine mammals. It often involves taking images from planes or drones. You're expanding large remote areas like doing transects over big regions of ocean. And super important for like getting whale dem demographics, population distribution, migration patterns, and like also relevant even to fisheries because like of course everything is connected and that's a very good indicator for a healthy ecosystem. Um, but within like one or two surveys, you might get 50,000, 100,000 images. And normally, um, or what's been done so far is after all of this data is collected, um, a marine biologist sits at a computer and goes through every image one by one looking for whales and circling them, right? And these are big images. So you zoom in onto a corner of the image and you go like up and down looking for that. And sometimes you don't see anything for a long time. Sometimes it's hard to tell if you're looking at a whale or if you're looking at a bird or you're looking at ice or you're looking at something else. And so that can often take, you know, um, multiple months, sometimes multiple years to go through that data. And with the oceans changing so quickly, like we can't afford to wait, um, you know, 18 months um, for our survey results before we make decisions. So what we've done is we've um, built a tool um, that uses artificial intelligence that complements human expertise to um, do that a lot quicker. Um, and so we've been able to take that process that usually takes, you know, over a year and do and do it within like a few days to a few weeks. So like a lot of time savings. Um, and what's been important for us is to make um, a tool that is that is flexible that can be used in a lot of different conditions and that is a pretty difficult technical challenge um i can if anyone wants to know more about that uh, feel free to contact me or like um to go on our website but basically I, I think what what i what i want to maybe end with is it's really important like to understand like the uses and limitations of ai it's a super powerful tool in like all aspects of ocean management. But when we're thinking of developing um, or using an AI tool, it's really important to think about like the scientific or technical standards as well as the ethical standards. So in the machine learning industry, we have like a saying that says garbage in, garbage out, which just means that your algorithm or your model is only as good as um, the data and the training set that you use. Um, to to train it. And so if you use like low quality data that is not well labeled to train your algorithm, 
you're getting an output that, you know, at best is very noisy and not very useful. At worst, will give you misleading information. So that's really important. And it's important to think about that. Where do your images come from? Who's labeling the images? Are they qualified to label images? Especially when we're talking about, you know, biology, it, 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 takes, it takes time to build that expertise. Um, and are these labelers, you know, fairly compensated? Are they incentivized to do a good job labeling? Um, that's a main, like, that's also like an ethical question to think of. Um, how are, uh, you know, how are these, these data collected? Um, is, are, are they doing it in a non-invasive way, like following, you know, good ethical protocols? And also what are, like, do, do, do we have proper performance metrics um, and statistics to show to so that we know like how accurate our model output is um, and so what what we found is a lot of ai solutions on the market today um, they'll say you know we'll, we'll we'll like label your data and we'll give you results but it's important to know like you know, how does this model perform and under what conditions um, so we've we've um, put out a paper recently that that we that we show that our model is you know um, uh, gets results that are uh, like 90 plus percent similar to a human observer. Um, and so they agree with a human uh, like over 90 percent of the time. And then we also define like what 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 do we mean by agreement, for example? And so that kind of thing um, is very important. And of course, like all um, AI solutions, all technology aren't made the same. And I just want to uh, to put that out there that those kinds of ethics and uh, technical uh, technical standards are are important to think about. But overall, like artificial intelligence is such um, a powerful tool that I think will really will really change things and is already changing things um, for uh, for conservation. I now conclude the session and invite Mr. Abhinav Shukla to deliver the vote of thanks. Before that, uh, I want to, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, since we are talking of, uh, I want to throw some light on the funding and you know, you're talking of funding. There's so many things going on in the world. I just will take uh, 30 seconds to share uh, what all is going on with the IUC and related to the funding. Like, for example, there is a blue natural capital financing facility which has been developed and it is funded by the government of Grand Duchy Luxembourg and they help in the BNC project with clear ecosystem services, benefits on multiple income streams and appropriate risk return profiles. Second, there is new blue accelerator fund uh, has been uh, developed which is to support blue carbon entrepreneurs it has been uh, funded with the jointly with the australian government department of agriculture and iucn is setting up this blue carbon accelerator fund and to conserve restore and coastal and marine ecosystems moreover uh, they, they have been saving the mangroves and 17 countries where IUCN has worked for the mangrove projects and like Kenya, Madagascar, Mozambique, Tanzania. And also in the Sel Salvador River Basin, they work to improve the co coastal watershed. Similarly, uh, there, uh, there has been a new arrangement which has been made in Seychelles for marine protection. And they have now local people can get involved in managing the marine protected areas for the first time in Seychelles. This has been with the efforts of IUCN. So similarly, IUCN has been working in resolution 122 uh, for the deep sea bed mining and they because a lot of biodiversity loss is there and 12 states have taken positions against such activities in the international waters. So that is how so by 2030, the priorities are to we have a healthy ocean which supports nature, people, which is governed by standard nations, international legal framework, sustainable investment that retain and restore ocean coastal biodiversity. Moreover, this latest agreement which you are talking of and IUCN is pretty hopeful that this agreement will give a major boost towards governments and international body to keep momentum for SDG 14. So not that uh, things are not happening. A lot of things are happening world around, but 
the the area is so big and we are almost well, 9 billion so it is slightly difficult but still i wanted to give some positive stories here thank you thank you ma'am i now invite mr abhita shukla to deliver the vote uh thank you dhruvi a very uh, good evening to uh, everyone joining us from various time zones it's an honor for me to propose the vote of thanks in this global panel discussion i would uh, like to extend my heartiest gratitude to all the panelists for sharing their valuable experience and addressing the audience professor dr mukesh bhatnagar independent consultant on fishery subsidies and international trade issues mr sunil mulidhar uh, shastri frgs frsa consultant ocean and environmental governance dr ritu dingra iucn cesp regional vice chair east and southern asia ms katherine have legal consultant and solicitor sydney australia ms lordes uh, director manati holdings limited dr ashmi agrawal professor shiv nadar university institution of eminence noida ms rena fan head of science communication and outreach whale seeker montreal canada i would also like to extend my sincere thanks to our honorable vice chancellor professor dr p c vivekanandan sir our registrar professor dr uday shankar sir the organizing secretary of this international conference dr ankit avasti sir and the organizing co secretary dr rana namneet roy sir i would also like to uh, thank the members of the faculty who were a part of this panel discussion ms anita singh ma'am for giving for delivering the welcome address and introduction of the panelists and also to our moderator ms ruby agrawal thank you everyone thank you very much thank you thank you very much thank you thank bye -bye. you very much bye 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 bye, bye, -bye. bye, -bye. thank you very much thank Thanks. you